Good morning and welcome to Hope United Methodist Church. We're glad you're joining us online in worship this morning. I'm excited to tell you that Steve Winters is here today to bring the second message in his series, We Are the Church. Last week, you might remember, he told us about the church of Thessalonica. This week, he's talking about the church in Corinth. Those two stories together give us a good idea of what it is to be the church. So I'm excited to hear Steve preach, and I'm excited that you're here with us. Won't you join us now in worship? Like a wildfire in my heart Sunday morning, hallelujah And it's lasting all week long Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's a rhythm of a gospel song Once you choose it, you can't lose it there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored. Oh, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander Turn to mountains That I can't climb Oh, you're with me You never leave me There ain't nothing There ain't nothing to steal my joy I got an old church choir Singing in my soul I got a sweet salvation And it's beautiful I got a heart overwhelming Cause I've been Singing in my soul, I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Gonna steal my joy. Well, first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Our second reading comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and, what, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. 
Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's a time that I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had I was running, I was searching But every place I turned for healing Left me more broken than the last Take me back to a place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To a faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they see me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church Tried to walk on my own, but I wound up lost Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross It's not a trophy for the winners shelter for the sinners and it's right where I belong Take me back to a place that feels like home to the people I can depend on to the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they see me at my worst to the love I had at first so I want to go to church
But we also learned that the Thessalonian church absolutely thrived after Paul's departure. It actually became a model church for the believers in the region. Well, this week we're going to talk about the church in Corinth. And although that church was founded in very similar circumstances, it faced a much rockier road as it developed. We need to learn a little bit about the city of Corinth to understand our lesson today. Corinth was located south of Thessalonia in um, the part of the um, Greek peninsula known as Achaia. It was located on an isthmus, which is a small strip of land between the Corinthian Gulf and the Saronic Gulf. Now, that seems pretty trivial, but the fact of the matter is, this um, is extremely important because it made Corinth one of the largest and busiest trading centers in the entire region, much more important than Thessalonica. This is because merchants preferred to bring their freight into Corinth, unload it, and haul it across that tiny strip of land, reload it on another ship, and take it from there. Um, this is because there, the sea was so dangerous in the south of Greece that no one wanted to go through there unless it was absolutely necessary. There was even a small wooden tramway built to haul smaller ships across this strip of land. Well, all the factors that we discussed about Thessalonica existed in Corinth. Corinth had diverse religious, political, sociological, and ep economic cultures. And if anything, Corinth was much more diverse than Thessalon Thessalonica was. And there was one more thing that would prove to be a real challenge for this new church. Corinth was known throughout the entire region for being a center of immorality, specifically sexual immorality. And I'm not talking about the kind of sexual immorality at night behind closed doors. I'm not talking about immorality being practiced by a sizable group of people. I'm talking about immorality being practiced as a matter of religious worship. You see, in addition to the dozens of other pagan idols, Corinth was the site of a major shrine to the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, and procreation. The priestesses of this shrine were, in fact, prostitutes. And worship of this goddess often included a visit with these priestesses. So this is where Paul's headed. After he leaves Thessalonica, he makes two additional stops at Berea and Athens before he arrives in Corinth. Now our, our first scripture reading today indicates that Paul arrived in town, set up his tent making shop with Aquila and Priscilla, and as was his practice, headed down to the local synagogue to reason to reason with the Jews and Greeks that were in attendance there. Well, as in Thessalonica, he had some fairly limited success in the synagogue. And if we read a little further into Acts 18, we see that the um, pattern of Thessalonica was repeated even further. At some point, the Jews in the synagogue turned against him and began to abuse him. Unlike Thessalonica, Paul didn't leave town at that point. Instead, he turned and started preaching and teaching to the Gentiles in the town. After, afterward, Paul spent a year and a half, 18 months, teaching and preaching in Corinth before moving on. So one has to wonder what Paul was thinking about um, as he was hitting the road and leaving Corinth. He has to wonder... Um, I think things, is gonna, things are going to go well here. He had spent 18 months preaching. He preached to an even wider audience than he had in Thessalonica. And we also should keep in mind that he was at Corinth when he got the great news about what was going on in Thessalonica. I mean, you got to think Paul was feeling pretty confident of the success of the church he had just planted in Corinth. So when we read our first passage from 1 Corinthians we may be surprised to find that things aren't really going all that well in Corinth. We find Paul imploring the believers in Corinth to put aside their disagreements so that there would be no divisions in the Corinthian church. 
It's clear that Paul has learned from sources that factions have arisen in the church. And from our reading, we can see that one source of these factions had arisen over personalities. Some followed Paul, others Apollos. Apollos was the person that had taken over the church after Paul left. Others followed Cephas, or Peter. At any rate, they had started dividing as a result of different teaching styles and different personalities over of individuals. Paul's response to this is particularly succinct. Was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name? Of course not. Paul goes so far as to say that he was glad that he only personally baptized two of the believers so that no one could say they were baptized in Paul's name. And although we don't see it from our reading today, there were other divisions growing in the Corinthian church. The church was divided over certain theological and doctrinal practices. There was division over the church's tolerance of certain acts of immorality left over from the um, pagan worship. And there appears to have been a division between socioeconomic classes within the church and the roles members of those classes were going to play. Those who had status due to the wealth or prestige that um, before the church was established felt that they should retain that status and prestige as they moved into the new church. One source I read while I was preparing for today attributed most of these divisions to a mix of arrogance and insecurity. The Corinthians were arrogant in their long-held beliefs and practices. And for some in that social, financial, and religious status that they had known um, before they turned to Christ. And I think maybe the insecurity is a natural consequence of what they were being asked to do. They were being told there is a better way, but to grasp it, you have to let go and turn away from everything that gave your life an illusion of security. Well, with all this in mind, Paul has to be asking himself, what am I gonna do with these Corinthians? Why can't they be more like the Thessalonians? Well, Paul's response to the Corinthians' problems is as simple as it is profound. First, he removes himself completely from the battle of personalities that the Corinthians seemed determined to wage. How easy would it have been for Paul to just say, look, don't worry about what all these other guys are saying. Just listen to me. I know what's going on. I mean, Come on, did Apollos meet Jesus on the road to Damascus? But he didn't do this. Instead, he directed the Corinthians to look at the common things that all of those mentioned were preaching. And of course, that's the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Whatever their individual differences were in their teaching and preaching styles, their backgrounds, or anything else, they were all teaching the same gospel message. And this leads us to the second aspect of Paul's response to the Corinthians. He stuck to the basics. He reiterated again and again the gospel message of Jesus' death and resurrection and what that means for those who believe it. With that as the church's foundation, no division can overcome it. So of course, as always, we must ask ourselves, what can we take away from this? How can we apply this scripture in our lives? And you know, there are so many great lessons to be taken um, when we look at these two churches. Um, but I wanna just concentrate on a couple of them. First, when it comes to discipleship, try to keep the personalities out of it. When we're talking about our faith, it's so easy to just inject our own opinions, interpretations, and life experiences into the discussion. And to some extent, that's not a bad thing. People naturally want to hear how our faith has affected our lives. And we all have great stories to tell in that regard. But the danger
danger comes when the concentration of the conversation centers on how our opinions, interpretations, and life experiences have affected our faith. When we allow those things to shape the essence of the gospel message that we're trying to communicate. And the other side of the coin is equally true. It is important that we do not, as the people of Corinth did, allow the source of the message to divide us. You know, I think we all have favorite preachers and teachers. Some people are just better at communicating the gospel than others are. The problem pops up when the messenger becomes more important than the message. And I would ask you to look, if your only source of Christian teaching is Billy Graham, David Jeremiah, Bishop Palmer, the Pope, or even an all-star like Warren Clifton, I strongly urge you to take a look and make sure that your faith is in the message and not the messenger. And let's face it, I would truly, truly hate to see you make an idol out of Warren. The second lesson I hope that we can take away from our little mini-series these past two weeks is just to never, ever give up being a disciple. No one ever said that discipleship is easy. Can you imagine the frustration that Paul must have felt when dealing with the Corinthians? And we, even, we haven't even talked about half of the issues that he dealt with in the church in Corinth. He was there several times, at least twice, probably three times. He wrote at least the two epistles that we know about, all trying to deal with various issues that are cropping up at the church in Corinth. But he never gave up on them. To Paul, each of the Corinthians, no matter how obtuse, no matter how mired in paganism, no matter how rich or how poor, was a child of God and worthy of receiving and understanding God's gift of salvation. And you know, if Paul was here today, he would think the same thing of each of the White Houseians, the Toledoans, and every single citizen of this world. But you see, Paul isn't here. It's up to us to fulfill our role as disciples. We must have the same perseverance as Paul. We must value each and every soul the same way that Paul did. You know, the essence of the world really hasn't changed a whole lot since Paul's day. We still have idol worshipers, politics, religion, money, social status, and other things still come between us and God. And many of those idols continue to cause division in our world. Just watch the evening news and try to find any story that unites us. And ironically, it seems that many of the things that we choose to unite around end up doing no more than to serve, to divide us from others. But you see, our job as disciples, our difficult job as disciples, is to look past all these dividing lines and not just look past them, but to cross them. We are called to take the gospel message to all. And we're called to do that with the certain knowledge that we will face the same arrogance and insecurity that Paul faced in Corinth. And we must be asking the same thing of new believers today that he did in Corinth and Thessalonica. Turn away from those idols that define you and give your life value and turn to God. And like Paul, we must do this while we acknowledge and work through our own spiritual weaknesses and frailties. And also like Paul, we must be prepared for the long fight. For each Thessalonica, there will be a Corinth, and we don't get to pick the easy path. So friends, are you ready to start down that road to Corinth? It will be a long, frustrating, and tiring trip. But I assure you that the price that you pay will be nothing compared to the reward that you receive. Let's pray. Lord, thank you.
thank you for the work Paul did in establishing the church. We are all benefactors of his diligence and hard work. And Father, open our eyes and hearts to see that you call us to be disciples no less than Paul. Give us the strength, perseverance, and most importantly, love for our fellow man to be your disciples. Celebrate with us our Thessalonicas and be our guide and rock when we come to Corinth. We pray this in the holy name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. of a changing order and face to face with new tasks baptize her afresh in the life-giving spirit of Jesus bestow upon her a great responsiveness to duty a swifter compassion with suffering and an utter loyalty to your will help her to proclaim boldly the coming of your kingdom put upon her lips the ancient gospel of her Lord Fill her with the prophet's scorn of tyranny and with a Christ-like tenderness for the heavy laden and downtrodden. Bid her cease from seeking her own life, lest she lose it. Make her valiant to give up her life to humanity, that like her crucified Lord, she may mount by the path of the cross to a higher glory. Through the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join us in our hymn medley, first song, Thy Word is a Lamp. Thank you.